season one, episode one of Strange Brow Radio. Thanks for tuning in. That 30-day hiatus uh, was necessary to retool and get everything in order here for 2021. So thanks for hitting the pause button for us. Of course, people over at Patreon were still getting all of their weekly shows. So if you want to listen to what you missed, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash strange brow radio. Also take a look at our Etsy shop. Christmas is here. The elves are ready. They're tired of wearing a mask. And so why make the elves breathe in all that CO2 when you can go to Etsy and go to Feral by Aaron, E-R-Y-N, your own Pacific Northwest elf hard at work here in Santa's workshop. Alchemy sound tools, drums, rattles, and smudge fans. Museum quality, beautiful, handcrafted. Alchemy sound tools at Feral by Aaron, E-R-Y-N. All right, today's show, I'll tell you more about that in a second. We'll be right back. Well, it's been about 30 days. I think it was episode... 100 before we switch gears and now we're we're back here we're doing four shows per season so look forward to those I, there's going to be more than four shows for podcasts during those season and you're going to want to find that stuff for either our live events that we want to do or just the regular content over at the youtube channel because that'll give us a lot more flexibility so if you can go to youtube hit the subscribe button and do it today while you're, you're hearing my voice to remind you that that's a helpful thing to do for our channel, along with all the other stuff as far as sharing and uh, hitting the alert button and the thumbs up button. All those things give us more flexibility to do more video, which is what I want to do. I have all this great equipment at my disposal, which was gifted to me by Irwell Wolfnosen over at Heart Unafraid. So we have a great camera, we have great mics, and we, uh, we have a beautiful gimbal here, which we can take out. I don't see why we wouldn't want to take this out deep into the woods and get really steady, amazing shots. And that gets us into today's guest. Now, I'm going to focus in on extended experiencers, and I'm going to do it with a seasoned professional someone who has looked at all angles of this here and I believe has the right approach as far as looking into it with a a very honest eye. So I sit down with ex-cop Rich Germo, and I'm at his house in this YouTube video that I urge you to go watch because I just uploaded it. And the audio is going to give you just the same as the video, I realize that, but watching micro expressions take place and the earnestness of Rich's story unfolding, uh, I think it's going to be worth your time. Plus, we're at his house where there's still ongoing activities, you know, sparse activity, but he lets me uh, go check out his property, and there really hasn't been anybody uh, that has done that before, and uh we find some stuff, and we, we got some great video of it. But the in-depth conversation with Rich is, is something I, I really think you should look at. Because you're going to learn something. I mean, we talk about stuff that uh, I've never heard other people discuss when it has to do with the DNA study or when it has to do with looking at this from a lawman's perspective. So um, this would be the third or fourth video, uh, or conversation rather, uh, that I've done with Riches, and I really wanted to give him a chance to ha- let this conversation uh, breathe. And so, um, if you can, go check out the YouTube video as well in company. If you're driving, obviously, you're going to want to listen to the audio portion and then get safely home and then uh, hit the subscribe button and share this video uh, with others if you feel like it. All right, so that's what's coming up in a moment. Uh, thank you again for uh, sticking with us here during these crazy times. What else do you call them? I guess they're times that test man's uh, very nature and heart and soul as well as women. So uh, I hope you're hanging in there with us. We all need a little bit of levity and we all need our own 
room to breathe. And uh, it's hard to do it when our faces are covered up so much. So uh, do what you can. This is what I do to keep my sanity coming. I, I hope I'm able to do this for a long time yet to come. And I hope you're able to find what, what keeps you sane as well. Maybe this show is a little piece of that. I, I hope so. All right. Well, I digress. Let's get started with my interview, my talk with ex-lawman Rich Germo. Okay, Rich. So the last time I was out here uh, would have been, I don't know, a couple months ago. And people sort of know your case. I would imagine a good amount of people that watch this video see your name come up and they know the incident at Harstein Island. But uh, in short, just remind people, um, you know, if you can, surmise it about what happened at Harstein Island and then we'll move forward from that time period. Um, well, Harstein Island happened in 2010, November of 2010. It was uh, basically the culmination, I would say, of where I started to understand and get somewhat peace with the whole situation where the event culminated where I had this traumatic incident occur related to an encounter or sighting that essentially tipped me over the edge, I would say. It basically sent me all the way into a comfortable place, I guess, to where I was building up to for a long time. And it finally gave me peace and comfort in my own mind, I would say, related to the Sasquatch topic, which evolved kind of into my whole life mm -hmm. in general. And it kind of set me apart, I would say, to where from kind of everybody else. And I wouldn't say it in the sense that, that I became like advantaged or, or better or anything else like that. I just had a different understanding basically based on my own life experience and what I had seen that showed me the world being a much different place than I had previously thought that it was. And that all started, you know, really the truth is, is that I'd always kind of been that way. You know, I remember the first incident when I was a kid that really I realized that something was kind of different about me was it was 1991 when the first Gulf War started. I was in junior high school, I think I was in eighth grade. The teachers organized a protest with the whole school and they basically said it was optional, you know, to go in and protest this war. And I was, remember I was looking at everybody else and the teachers were basically telling us what to think and that was what was in my mind. And I had a, a two cousins that were over there fighting in, in that war, you know, and some I had a different viewpoint, you know, from other people. But really the truth was is that I noticed and recognized that this was kind of a mass hurting thing, at least even in that sense, to where pretty much everybody was just going along with what the teachers said they should do, regardless of what they thought or not, and they wanted to just be part of the group and to do everything what everybody else was doing so they weren't singled out. So ultimately what it came down to is a school of like 600 kids. Only me and one other kid abstained from this thing and decided we weren't going to partake. But essentially that, you know, set in my mind that, okay, I don't really think like the rest of these people do. If it's just me and one other kid out of 600 that decided that we weren't going to be part of this herd mentality and this sheep thing, because that's what I recognized it as even then, that even though I maybe had a different viewpoint, really the reason why I didn't want to partake is just because everybody else was doing it. And they didn't even really know why they were doing it. I, I recognized the idea that maybe all of them don't agree with this, but they're just going along with it because... They don't want to be set apart and singled out as having a different viewpoint or opinion or being different. I, even at that time, had enough confidence in myself that I took a great pride in the fact that I could stand up for myself and not go along with what everybody else did. And I think that kind of started something even that far back. You know, and then I always kind of questioned things and thought for myself, you know, in like growing up, I realized kind of at a young age too that when we would be in class or discussing things, especially as it got into high school more where independent thought was more encouraged and we started talking about current events and things that were going on in politics, social events and, and social history and stuff of that nature, I started to realize, you know, even then and, and even earlier, 
that I necessarily would look at something in a much different way than everybody else would. But I also realized that I was going to be on my own, generally speaking, with the way that I thought about something or the context I thought about it in or, or the picture that I viewed it in. And that I would have to think about things in two ways pretty much right away. I'd have to think about the way I would think about it. And then I would have to consider how everybody else is going to think. And then I would have to either hold my tongue or I would have to assimilate into what they think, even though I held a different viewpoint of it. So I had to survive in that, and I had to basically hide, you know, essentially my own thought process and the fact that I had different viewpoints than everybody else did. And I didn't really understand the magnitude of that, but I questioned a lot of stuff. And it got to be, you know, 2000, in the year 2000, when I was a cop in La Push. And the uh, reason why I became a cop is because I started out going to college a little bit, and I thought it was just stupid, you know, that uh, I was wasting my money to get a piece of paper, you know, that didn't really mean anything. And so I didn't want to commit to anything like that. And I certainly, you know, didn't want to um, get stuck into this process of having to go along with somebody else's ideas and stuff and just assimilate into some job, you know, that I hated and just had to work. So I wanted to be a cop because it was easy and that I thought that my skill set would fit good into it and that I wouldn't have to commit that much into it. I was kind of lazy in the fact that I didn't want to dedicate a bunch of time in education to work up towards some goal or some job to make money. So I thought that being a cop would be pretty easy for me to do and that um, I could just do it based on my self, my life experience, you know, that I, it was going to be easy for me. And it was, you know, I worked my way into it. And then I became bored with it as time went on. You know, I took a few steps where after about five years, I had experienced everything. I was completely bored with the job. You know, I didn't like a lot of aspects of it anymore. And so then I became a detective, you know, because it was something different and new. But within a short time of that, even, it doesn't matter what the cases are, it's just repetitive. It doesn't matter if it's a sex, child sex offense case, a burglary, a homicide, or a major assault, or theft, whatever it is. It's maybe different players involved, but the process is all the same every time. Right. It's the same type of event. You're dealing with the same minds of people. It's over and over again, just repetition. And, and you're not really even doing a very good job, you know? I mean, essentially, it's a fit. I wouldn't say that, but the system doesn't work right. And um, anyways, so, you know, I was a whistleblower and all that stuff. You know, and then I had the sighting, the Bigfoot sighting in 2000. And that kind of culminated everything because I guess it gave me the, it started to make me start to question everything after I had that encounter. Mm -hmm. Because like I have said many times in different interviews, after the shock and awe wore off of it, I immediately felt betrayed. Well, how long did the shock and awe last? Not long. I mean, uh, I was enamored probably with it for a year. No, less. less. Um, did you get angry? The, uh, I was angry a little at, at the... Uh, well, Not at the ridicule factor. No, no, no. I didn't care about ridicule even then. Um, a little bit. And, and, and I, I, didn't, I didn't care. Uh, I would bring it up, you know, whoever, if, if the topic came up. But I wasn't engaged in research or anything like that. I would just say, I seen one when I was working in La Push, and everybody knew about it. But what I became angry about, I felt betrayal from my own country because, and I know it's a weird way to look at it, but I had sacrificed everything. I joined the military, I had taken oath, you know, and I took my oath seriously that I was to protect this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and everything else that that says. And I took a similar oath every time that I went to work for a police agency. Mm -hmm. You know, and at that time I only I worked at the Department of Defense Police and Forks, I was a dispatcher there for short, like a few weeks, and then I went to work in La Push Police Department. So the reason why that I was angry and I felt betrayal, I think, is because, well, in fact, I know it. It's because that if I was willing to give up so much for my country and potentially my own life, how come I had to see this thing and suffer all the psychological aspects of the encounter? Because I recognized that, that this was a belief system destroying and altering event, right? When anybody has one of these type of events. And so like you have to go in and in your own head and start questioning all kinds of stuff, and especially if you already think in a broad aspect, like I did, 
it started to make me think about a lot of different things, you know, and, and immediately, like I said, after the shock and awe wore off, the immediate shock and awe would probably only lasted 45 minutes or so, you know, and then I started in my own mind to think about, you know, well, how come I didn't know about this thing? And I'll, I'll say that the fear aspect of it lasted a very long time, years. It changed my behavior and my conduct in the woods, especially my mm -hmm. hobbies and stuff and how I did stuff mm -hmm. because I didn't really have much fear before other than from cougars or bears. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent lots of time out in the woods in real dark in places by myself. I'd go in miles at a time fishing these rivers and I fished. I wasn't in a Bigfoot or nothing. I just fished all the time. I never saw any Bigfoot tracks or anything like that. All over, way away from people, miles up sometimes. I mean, I would go up five, six miles and do 10, 10 miles round trip in a day by myself in the middle of winter time, pouring rain and snow, you know, whatever, just to go fishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I had that encounter, for a couple of years, I didn't go anywhere by myself anymore because I had this realization that there was this massive humanoid hair covered thing out in the woods, excuse me, that when I seen it and realized what it was, which was fairly immediate, that I knew that I had no defense mechanism against this thing. And this thing had superiority and full advantage in all aspects over me, right? I could immediately identify that just by seeing it. I didn't see it run or anything like that. It didn't even acknowledge me when it went by, you know, it just, did its Richard, thing. After your encounter, the timeline of events, I want to get these right. Did you start to learn that this thing not only had superiority as far as its physicality, but the other interesting aspects of it too? Not for a long time. How long did that process take where you... Harstein. Before Harstein, up when I started investigating, really, at I started interviewing witnesses. Mm -hmm. When I became entrenched in this in 2008-9, with the Olympic project and Randall's and I started to contact and talk to witnesses, right? And that's when, uh, as a, I was a detective at that time for the sheriff's office and I did all kinds of different cases. I did everything from sex offenses to uh, homicides, major assaults, everything. So in you know. 2009 you're I did one homicide. As 2011 I was employed to as a cop. Okay, so yeah. you're doing active witness uh, testimonies, talking to witnesses. While I'm doing Bigfoot investigations at the same time. There's two people that have ongoing... Some of them. Yeah. And some of them are just road crossings. It was uh, Most of these contacts happened through the BFRO database. Old, old, mm -hmm. old accounts through flats, the stuff that people don't see, and, and recent ones too. And so I would contact these people and every, you know, three or four out of every three or four you would contact, it seems like you would get one that would have strange things or repeated encounters. And uh, it happened to be a significant amount of the evidence. And at that time, you know, uh, so when well I- Well over 25% of the people you're talking to have the stranger- I think it's well higher than that actually, but I think that, I think- to talk about it. It's the people that have the long-term encounters or the repeated type ones mm -hmm. that have these type of things. The people that just happen to see one, to them it's, it's, it's just an anomalous situation that just occurred and they happened to cross paths. And I don't even think it's that random, even any of it. I don't think any of mine was random. I don't think it is with anybody, uh, in fact. But I'll tell you that as this process built on, I, I kept talking to witnesses and I kept getting weird stories. Everything from cloaking to throwing sound to mimicry to weird shit, you know, to tracks disappearing out of nowhere, to stuff that doesn't logically make sense. And because I was a black and white logical type thinker, I was pretty confident in my investigative capabilities. In fact, I was so confident coming into the Bigfoot thing that I believed honestly that if I committed to this, that nothing would stop me and I would achieve it and I would win, you know, because that's what I wanted to do. I was going to be the one that went all the way because I won't give up. I'll be relentless because I was at, I'm that way during investigations. I'm that way whatever I decide that I'm going to do. I master it. I, I do whatever I can. I turn over every rock, right? I'm going to get to the bottom of it. No one's going to stop me. That's just the way it is. I mean, I don't have, I'm not going to fail. I just won't. So I came into that with that belief, right? And that it was a likely a relic hominid and it was extremely rare, and it was avoiding human, humans because it's just really rare, and it, it, it's smart, and mostly because it's uncommon and rare. But then I started to see through this that that wasn't the case, because just on flats alone, if you look at the database and you look at how condensed the sightings are, I mean, how many are happening in areas that are close to each other over long, repeated periods of time. And this is before the DNA, which confirmed a lot of things for me. Um, 
and, and what my thought, fish and thought process was and added so much evidence to the big picture to me, what the, what the findings and the results were. And it may not be the results and findings that most people think were super significant, but through what I was learning, these things were extremely significant because what I was seeing is that rarity wasn't an issue. These things are not rare. And I was doing different stuff in different places. I was leaving toys out in some spots and other places. I was being totally non-invasive and I didn't want my intentions known. I just wanted to be looked at a regular person or a hunter or somebody who's finding game mm -hmm. or walking around. I don't want to be looked at doing Bigfoot. I, I was trying to not entice anything like that. I wanted uh, to have a non-invasive presence. So you're, you're already acti uh, actively trying to set your intention. That's how ingrained you were with the supernatural that these things were reading your mind? Were you already thinking that way? or did, did I didn't think they were supernatural. I didn't know anything about that until uh, finally it culminated with Hardstein, but I, I, was, I, was, I was turning that way. Be, and, and the reason why I was, uh, that I was turning that way is because I was considering all the evidence. It wasn't because I had experience or, or, or I had. I did it. Some weird stuff happened there, and I had interaction with a long-term witness who had mind speak and was relaying information to me later but he didn't tell me in real time as it was happening because he didn't think that I'd be willing to or capable of accepting what he knew right but later he told me and then it, it made sense because it, it matched up with so everything that was happening turn the corner, he not on he wasn't trying to uh -huh. it just happened to be that the evidence the evidence that he provided to me was able to help my body evidence to bring me to move forward but I still couldn't accept it all until I experienced it firsthand at Harstein, right? I mean, until I had a real paranormal type event occur with me. So you go out to an extended experience or a house or someone who's a habituator, let's say someone that's having these weirder things, and here you are as a seasoned investigator. A cop. As a cop, a you're hearing all this crazy shit. How do you continue uh, talking to them? How do, you, how do you compartmentalize all the weird shit as it goes along? Well, here's the thing. Look, I'm an investigator, right? I can't discount somebody because they might be off or because they may have a different viewpoint or they may view the, wor view the world in a different way than I do or have different experience that I have. I have to consider that these people have a different life experience than me and that potentially they have a different experience than me. Even then, and I haven't experienced this paranormal stuff, paranormal type stuff, it doesn't mean that I'm not open-minded to the possibility. Just because I haven't experienced it doesn't mean it's not real or true. Right. And so they're saying all this weird shit to me. And but I'm also psychologically, you know, looking at these people and considering why they're thinking the way they are, what life experience they have, potentially that's steering them in this potential wrong direction. And maybe that really they're misconstruing something or maybe something explainable. But I'm also considering the fact that it might be what they are exactly telling me and that, um, there may be more to this than I understand because this is all building up that I have to consider all this other stuff that mm. doesn't fit into the box that everybody else is in. I have to consider it because it's repeating itself over and over again from different people with different backgrounds and different life histories. They are having the same type of experience. At least they think they are and they're revealing it to me and it's part of a pool of evidence that's all going. So you have all this pool of black and white evidence, like your footprints, your hair, your DNA, your visual sightings and all that. And then you have this other pool of evidence that's repeating as well. It's just as much there as the other stuff down below. And it's just as repeated, right? But it happens to only be repeated with long-term people that have long-term type and repeated type things happen with these things. And all of those type incidents seem to also be similar right with this whole thing so I'm, I'm starting to figure out that these things aren't rare so this idea that they just are smart and rare doesn't fit into the box that um, explains any of this stuff because it's not that at all it's they're not rare and so then you have to start looking at everything different because once you realize that these things aren't rare and what culminated i guess and what gave me the solid piece of evidence to know that they're not rare is through this dna study Right, we identified four individuals out of a family group, right, that were all related to each other. I think a, a father, mother, a child, and then a cousin. Um, and then I also collected saliva and off my game camera with those pictures, right? That is only eight miles of the crow flies where I got those pictures to where these were at. But there's no genetic relation between the two.
only eight miles apart, yet they're not related. They're not even cousins. So if you're dealing with an extremely rare species, you're going to have a relationship between one individual and four individuals that are only eight miles apart from each other. There's going to be a genetic relationship. It's not going to be that far back. They're going to be cousins, but they're not, right? Which tells you that... And you can get that specific just from saliva and hair through the DNA. This is what you're relying on. Well, Melba has all the data. She knows. In fact, I, other than uh, that one family group that we found, out of those 111 individuals that they identified in that study, um, none of them are related to each other. Right? None of them are related. In fact, Melba told me their, DV, their DNA is just as diverse as ours is. Meaning that there's not few. There's many. And that they don't have to inbreed. They don't need to inbreed. There's plenty of, of them out there that there's no inbreeding. Right? They don't inbreed with each other. That, and so it tells you they're not rare. And then if you look at the sightings, just go to the BFRO site. And if you had all of the sightings, not just the ones that are on the site, the ones that are in flats, the other 90%, you would see how many sightings that there really are, how close together they are in regions. 90% of the reports are I think 90% are unpublished, yeah. So what good are they? Are they are well, they're good for them. That's what I mean. It's, it's just... It's a tool. It's a way for them to collect for themselves. Well, and I don't think that it's not that they, um, there's a nefarious purpose while they're not published. There, potentially, there could be some not publishing maybe because of paranormal aspects in the past with a lot of these cases, because a lot of them that aren't published do have this. Mm -hmm. But some of them that do have that are also published. I think it's more or less the disorganization mm -hmm. and the fact that, and I'm guilty of it myself, when I picked up reports, I was an investigator, so the last thing I want to do is publicize them, right? So I just buried them, mm -hmm. hid them, kept them for myself to investigate what I wanted to investigate. Right. Right. And then I got chastised for that by a moneymaker and I don't blame him because I wasn't using for, for, I was being as selfish with, with it and I wasn't using it for the proper purpose. And then a lot of people don't. I mean, Scott Taylor is really good. He, he publishes all kinds of reports through there. I mean, that's yeah. his, he's doing the right thing, you know, with that, but there's so many that aren't published, you right. know, and with Scott, I mean, you get the permission, I guess, is maybe the wrong word, but there is an open door with Scott as a VFRO investigator to look into the, the paranormal aspects sure. of a sighting. Well, even and they're changing. Even they're that changing. didn't exist with the VFRO back then, did it? No, but, but, but nobody. It didn't exist, exist with hardly anybody. All these people that were like me and you were on the fringe of this thing way back then, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, where we were just the crazy people. It's like this. Really, the population issue became a huge factor to, for me, and it's what, honestly, it's the one piece of evidence that started to really give me a different viewpoint, or at least make me more acceptable to the other viewpoint, because I could not legitimately consider the rarity as a reason that they're not identified or known. It's not because they're rare, right? They're common. That was apparent. You know, I mean, I was taking reports of these things crossing golf courses and housing developments. I got two reports of that in Lakeland Village Golf Course of uh, twilight sightings, right about daylight, seeing these things run across the fairway and hide out in, a, in an island of trees and then take off again and hit another one. People drinking coffee in the morning, seeing them, right? This is Allen, Washington. This is right um, around a lot of people, right? Yeah. And um, you got to consider is that why... If these things are ultra super rare, how come they get seen around people so much where people live in houses and stuff like that? Is it because of their curiosity and they want to come close or why aren't they out in the wilderness hiding out from us so we can't find them? It's like they're right here. It, it, none of it makes sense. None of the idea that they're rare and that that's why we can't find them makes any sense whatsoever about any of it. You know, they're not rare. If they're so easy to find and they're not difficult to find, you would know that. They're really not hard to find. How can they be rare? Right? They're all over. Are you saying privately that the Meldrums of the world already, they've already been there for a while. They know the numbers are large. They know they have these other abilities, and that's how they elude. Are you saying that they all know this and they're disinformation? Well, I don't know if they know it or not, because it would be hard for me to believe that they didn't know after spending years in this, because... Even Derek Randall's, you know, explained in an strange experience to me that he wasn't willing to attribute it to any type of paranormal thing. It was just an anomalous, right. you know, coincidence to him. He was doing research in the Blue Mountains, right? And he came home. Home of Paul Freeman's. 
footage. Yeah, all that he used stuff. to go over there in the 80s and spend a lot of time, early 90s in the blues, and he'd go in and by himself, and he, he had a lot of interesting stories. He knew Paul personally, and a lot of other people over there like Paul. And uh, he had an incident over there where he was doing research one weekend, and he came home, and he got wood knocks at his house right when he got home, playing his day, you know. And, and he just thought it was weird. But he thought enough of it to let me know that he recognized it, what it was, and he didn't really what, know what to make of it, you know. Uh, but even uh, Tom Powell has the same story, right. you know. It's a repeated story with researchers, right? It just happens. And they really don't have a good explanation for it, mm -hmm. other than like in Tom's instance, he's the type of thinker that considers that information probably from the get-go. And that just makes a light bulb go on in his head that, okay, I'm dealing with something a little different here. This isn't totally an organic thing. There's more going on in this situation. So for Tom, it was easy for him to, to make that transition and to, to start having these wake-up realization moments of this thing, right? Same thing kind of happened with me, but it actually took much longer with me because it was so ingrained with me an investigative standpoint of being a black and white, looking at things. Not gray, but I'm looking at it black and white, and I'm picking the pieces apart to try to put it all back together again in the right order. So it took me longer. You know, like I said, Harstein, essentially, where it culminated, where I had this experience, and then this ongoing thing that happened afterwards that forced me to not be able to, de to deny it any longer. I had no choice but to just accept it for what it was and to essentially rebuild my belief system accordingly. It was already being done anyhow, but that finished it off. And then, you know, finally through these events that occurred, you know, and these strange things that even happened to me, Mm -hmm. I got a, a major comfort out of the whole thing where I pretty much finally just cut loose and just went all the way to where I felt good and comfortable. And um, I didn't really care anymore what anybody thought. I really didn't care about that before, but even now but it I don't. the kind of activity you had personally when you rounded that corner with them. Did they, did they notice that you'd changed? I don't. I mean, did, would, do you feel like you were being, as an investigator, you know, the grooming process is obviously how a predator works. Do you feel like they were grooming you in order to make these next steps? Because you talk about a time when there is a demarcation line between you and them where they basically say, if you want to come here and no more, get, you know, inducted into these hidden schools, you have to you know, do A or B and you weren't willing to do it. Maybe. It's very strange because, you know, I've looked at this one way and tried to con figure it out in my own mind of what's behind it all, what it all is. But I've never ever gotten any confirmation from them. It's them anyway, for sure. You know, I don't know. You know, the thing is, is I've considered the fact that it's them. And then I have also considered, considered the idea that it maybe wasn't them that maybe their purpose and what they were using, maybe they were being used as a tool to try to send me on a path and to force me into a certain direction. Um, because like for instance, when after the Harstein event and, and the first thing that started happening was waking up at 3 a.m. and I would have this impression. This, the one thing about that, obviously I assumed it was them that were the ones communicating with me, right? And it wasn't ever in any words or anything like that. It would, I would wake up and I would have a solid impression in me. But the one thing that was strange to me about that, and it made me consider the potential that it maybe wasn't them talking to me or, or sending me this impression or waking me up, was that it was always in a third person, right? Whoever was sending me the information was referring to them in a third person. It wasn't referring, don't follow us, don't look for us anymore, don't do your cameras don't do that. It was them. Don't do it. Don't follow them. Don't do your cameras anymore. Don't do it anymore. You can't do it anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, they showed up in my house and screamed. And then the TP thing in the road that I talked about before. And then here, obviously, they want, whatever it was wanted me to think it was them, or it was indeed them when I had the dealings with the two different mediums. Um, and I believe that it possibly was them. But I don't know. Right. Well, let's, okay, just to give a little bit of context to the mediums here, I think people can go back and listen to previous episodes that we've done where we talked about this, but there's this uh, part of your life where you know what they can do, pretty much, 
you have to set parameters and limits around the types of experiences that are happening at your home. Meanwhile, psychic mediums are confirming the fact that yes, they can mind speak and they mm -hmm. access people like antennas to, to get stuff. And then you cool your jets big time. I mean, you kind of put the whole thing to bed after the Melba Ketchum stuff you know, falls flat on its face as far as a PR move, but you get your answers that you want, that yes, they, they have this otherness about them. Well, I'll tell you. So after the Harstein incident, I mean, I could consider that maybe I'm being programmed, I guess you could say, because I'm being repeatedly sent the same information, the same message to stop looking for them, stop doing this. Stop. And I was trying to ignore it because I had worked so hard and I wasn't going to let anything derail me. Like I told you before, I'm committed. When I do something, I'm going to do it. And, and, and the fact is that Harstein, that was a culmination in many different ways because I actually seen it. I heard it. They knew I was coming. I'm right there. You know, at the same time, I have all this massive like, fear in me and this voice in my telling me more or less or this impression at the same time, right, you need to stop. Right? I'm like, no way. So I, I mean, I remember I, I waited for it one night. When I woke up, I thought to myself, I'm going to ask what happens if I don't stop? What are the consequences? I did. Nothing. They didn't respond. Nothing back. No impression back. The next day, no nothing. No consequence expressed. Nothing. It's like I asked a question and I didn't get no answer back. This is in the dream state. No, I was awake. Okay. I would always wake up, right? If, so it's no dream. At 3 a.m., I would wake up like whoop, out of bed. I'd be wide awake. Right, and I'd look at the clock, and it would be three on the dot, exactly three zero zero every time, and it happened like sixty times in a row. I'm not shitting you, but I was fighting it, and um, I would wake up, and immediately my head would be clear, and immediately it would pop, pop into my head: stop looking for them, stop doing your cameras, don't do it anymore. Right, and then finally, after like the first week or so, I said, "What happens if I don't?" Because I don't have an intention of stopping, even though. Everything in me is telling me to. I'm being pulled real hard. I'm fighting it because I've invested way too much into this and I'm right where I want to be. I'm right at the cusp of this thing. I just seen them. Sure, I was scared shitless and had all this fear input in me, but I can override all this, you know. I can do it and I can force this to happen. I can be a control of this and I can force it, you know. And uh, I kept going back and then the Annie would get upped. They scream at my house. I got the teepee. And the teepee one is what really freaked me out bad because I had to consider everything about that and what it really meant. You know, when I'm driving down the road, don't know I'm kind of becoming that direction home, and this thing is waiting for me, and it's this teepee structure that I put at all these sites. It's this crude teepee with a balance stick on top. And what really was weird about it, you know, it looked like a tornado had touched down there, and it was all this debris was nicely spread in the circle, but everything was pointed in the same direction in a circle going out. And it was very conformed. You know, it wasn't like a mess or random. And then there was an eye in the center that was hollow with no debris, clean. And then the teepee. And it's right in my lane of travel. Large? No, this tall. Okay. Same one that I would make when I go out to these sites. Okay, so let's pause that there just based upon what happened after I left, right? I, I came out to your property mm -hmm. and found something out in the woods. A couple of days later, you find a teepee structure, but some, I think your wife took credit. She for said it. she put it in the yard. Now, I mean, do you put any credence to that, that it's somehow related to what you just talked about? Well, maybe she put the structure there because something told her to do it. You know, something's working through her. You know, she wouldn't recognize or be aware. Right. I mean, do you think that she actually built it? She said she did. Yeah, but wouldn't that be a strange thing for her to do? Yeah, she'd never done it before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you haven't had anybody out here. I mean, it wasn't the only... And I hadn't even talked about... I don't talk about Bigfoot with her. No. Mm -mm. It's not a topic. She doesn't have encounters. You guys don't share no. information. She doesn't want to know about it. Right. And the reason I bring that up is just based upon this cooling off period. But she built the same one, and she'd never seen it before. So how similar was it? Same. It's just tiny. Balancing on it? Yeah, it was just the one she built was this tall. And it had a balance Show stick on top. I mean, in comparison. This little, tall. And you said it was dead sticks. Dead sticks. It was mm -hmm. salmonberry sticks. And it was mm -hmm. three of them and then a, and a stick on top. Okay, and, so you have this, uh, just for the sake of the battery, um, 
you have this cooling off period here. You, you get your answers, basically. Mm -hmm. You know what you're dealing with. Also, from a religious standpoint, because you're a Christian guy, yeah. uh, it's, it's coming into the world of the Nephilim. Is that fair to say? Uh, I had considered the idea, but I was um, in denial about it. Um, I didn't want it to be that way. And, uh, but the DNA certainly was supporting that idea. Right. And um, uh, my experiences were starting to support that idea. You know, um, but they hadn't really fully supported it yet up to that point. But that's see where I was questioning the idea that, and this is still a, a strong possibility, that I think that I think maybe it was really God that was talking to me at 3 a.m. in the morning and telling me he's guiding me and telling me not to anymore. But, but here's the thing where this, you know, this story gets like that, that the teepee, right? And it just in my lane of travel. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that it, the coincidence of it, the fact that it was exactly the same thing that I did, I really knew that it likely there's probably less than a chance in a million some kids were around at four, two in the morning, you know, that were put this thing in the road for me to drive up to. Yeah. And this road gets traffic on it because people work at the shipyard there. Ten minutes won't go by till somebody drives by and runs over that thing, right? But it was there for me to see. So I really had to consider that. And, and even for a long time, I didn't discuss it with Bigfoot people at all because when you consider what that was, why it was there, Naturally, you have to take it to the place to, to the idea that these things knew where I was going to be at this time. And so naturally, you have to consider that they don't operate by the same r rules of time and space. It's different. They have power that we don't really understand or know. They knew where I was going to be, when I was going to be it. They put, or whoever put it, put the thing that I built right there in my lane of traffic. And, it, and in the sense that this thing just appeared like a UFO came down and put it there or something. There is a, there is a debris field around it, and it's in an eye, and it's there. So all aspects of this need to be looked at of what it is, right? And, and so I considered, to me, what it made me realize is that the power and, 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 and that mm -hmm. I'm dealing with something pretty scary in an aspect, potentially, that they have this kind of power. But they wanted to show me, I think, that they, I did it, same one. You know, yeah. but it's a projection of power, right? It's a showing you a capability, right? That they have this capability, they can do this. And that has to be respected because we don't understand it. We don't know where it comes from. I'm pretty sure that was them. This goes on, I end up moving up here. I didn't do anything for a long time. And then I started doing wood knocks up here over a period of time and I did a specific sequence and about six months later, I did probably wood knocks five days a week. I got an answer back, and then I went back and forth with him mm -hmm. for that day. I mean, just for a few minutes, and then nothing stopped. And the next day, I get Ohio House from across the street, seven or so in a row at 7 p.m. in the daylight in like July. It's, I think, July or August. Um, and then a whole bunch of activity started here for quite a long time. We've never seen them. We found impressions up behind the house, leading from down there. My brother got his cabin slapped a few times. His girlfriend was in it one time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you just, all kinds what, of stuff we what, heard. What about uh, the strange wind? Oh, here? Yeah. Oh, we have a lot of weird wind up here where it comes from all different directions at once. Like you'll be driving down the road and the trees will be blowing like four directions in 100 yards. You can see them. But you've had this happen underneath the cover where there should be no wind, right? Your mother described a, a strange wind in the house. Oh, in the house. Yeah, she had an event happen in there too. Yeah. But that was before I lived here, I believe. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you don't, do you think it's linked at all to Maybe. the land? Well, I think that this area in particular might be kind of a vortex in a, in a bit of a way because um, there's a big aquifer underneath of us right here right now, and there's a big lake over there that's really deep that's anomalous compared to all the other lakes around here. It's clear water, and then it pours down into the creek that goes out of this okay. lake. But... There's a, maybe attracted to this because it is a, a power spot. It is. I think so. There's been other cryptids seen here. Bigfoot has been seen here, but nothing... Can you say something about a cave bear? Some Two people have allegedly seen what they described as a cave bear back on the pipeline range. Some guy looked at it through binoculars, even. It was brown. It looks like a bear, but it has a tail. And it's light brown. It has a tail like a wolf. But yeah. it's large. And it's been seen three different times. What about lights? Do people talk about UFOs and lights? Not that I'm aware of up here. No. Uh, black cats have been seen up here, too. Okay. My dad potentially saw one. 
mm -hmm. uh, down on the cutoff down there. Mm -hmm. Quite a few sightings of black cats, actually. I haven't seen one, but other people have seen and them. And people have tried to access you, uh, you know, co-opt you, co-opt you for information. I mean, we've talked a little bit about that off the record. I don't know if you want to talk about it on sure. the record. But as far as people trying to access you for your Bigfoot stuff, have people tried to compromise you to basically discredit you? For Bigfoot? Yeah. I don't know or aware. I don't think that stuff maybe was related to Bigfoot. It could have been potentially, partially. Uh, I think that's more related to current events. What about people in the Bigfoot world? Have they tried to discredit you? No. Because you talk about being uh, bulletproof to a degree, like you're non-corruptible rich. Well, yeah, they don't really come after me much. Yeah. Because there's not really anywhere they can go or get me, because I'm pretty honest about stuff. So I just tell you how it is. I don't keep any secrets. <laughs> I just tell you what I know, yeah. or what I, my experience is, or, and what I think, yeah. you know, and I don't really care uh, as a result of that, and I don't, I can't really be attacked too much personally, mm -hmm. so really nobody attacks me. Mm -hmm. If they do, they go away real quick. Mm -hmm. They don't stick around for very long. I fight them off yeah. very, fairly fast. I mean, you've rounded a corner as far as like deciding where this research should go, and it, in your opinion, it doesn't belong in the world of the relic hominid at all. No. That doesn't help the conversation. So where do, what, what helps move this conversation? If the DNA study, it doesn't do it. Um, it really hasn't moved the conversation except for you personally, not, not as far as the public relations. Where do we go to move this conversation with? I mean, scripture? Do we go to uh, you know, oral traditions of the Native Americans? What do we do to, to understand the phenomenon? I think this is where it goes from here. I think we're plateaued on it totally i don't think we can really go much further because i mean we have tons of evidence it's not a question whether or not they exist or they're real or not the question is what are they and, and i think that people are figuring that out on a personal level mm -hmm. at least to where they're comfortable with it and, and that's as best as we can do right now i think and i think that what we're waiting for is disclosure um which i think it's got to come at some point mm -hmm. um but it's whoever is Control in the system has got to decide to divulge everything because they know it all. I mean, it's not as if any of this is any secret. And that's like I've talked this about before. It's only logical to consider me from a background or a law enforcement, you know, and the way that I look at things and what I consider and what I know is the fact that if you have an unidentified humanoid, whatever it may be, that's within the United States, that's here in, in, in fairly robust numbers, or even if there were few, our intelligence service would consider that a threat to the national security of this country. These are, these are undocumented, unknown humans, humanoids that potentially have superpowers, right? So you're going to want to know everything that you can know about them. So you're going to exhaust every available resource at your disposal right. to find out as much as you possibly can, to include every piece of technology from the time that you became aware of this to what we are right now. You're going to do everything you're possibly capable of doing to gain as much information that you can. Because if these things are what we believe that they are based on our experience, that they have you know, certain abilities and powers that regular humans don't have, uh, they're going to want to try to unravel that and to see if they can utilize that for some sort of an advantage, that knowledge or information that they can gain. And they're just going to, they're going to, know, they're going to know whatever they have to know about it. Right? There's no way that they're going to not know. There's just no way. It's not even a question that should be considered that they don't know. Right. It's just stupid to even think that. I mean, it sounds like you're talking about UFO disclosure. It's, it's the uh, I don't think it is. I think it is within the same ballpark, but I don't think, I think that the Bigfoot thing is much different in a sense than the UFO. Wow. I think they're connected, but I don't think Why they're the same. So because you look at the stance of the UFO thing in the United States government, and they're much more comfortable to softly or even not so softly disclose now. But they don't want to say shit about Bigfoot. And the, you do a public records request for Bigfoot, and I guarantee you're not going to get shit back. It doesn't matter where you're looking. You do a public records request or a Freedom of Information request on UFOs, you're going to get lots of stuff back. It's going to be redacted, but you're going to get piles, especially if you do broad requests. You do Bigfoot requests, you're going to get, uh, you know, the 1963 Army Corps Engineers book. That's it. But the truth is this, and this is another piece of evidence, a significant piece of evidence that I consider when, when considering the fact that they know. Me being an investigator, even being a new cop in those days, I mean, I only had a couple of years of experience. I already knew the significance of my encounter and my sighting. I knew that, not right away, 
But as time went on, I started to think about this and how the significance of it. I was a professional on duty. I had this sighting of this cryptoid that's not supposed to be real and sure as shit it was. It, it was right there in front of me. I, even at that time, you know, I understand the significance and the power and the fact that I am considered to be a credible person in a court of law, right? The court considers me credible, right? My word is good in court. Still is, never been challenged. Under oath, my word's credible in any court of law. Whatever I say is considered to be prima facie evidence as an eyewitness, right? As my experience and my training as a trained observer, I'm, I'm an expert. So would not it be valuable if we have this unknown hominid roaming around that's not acknowledged by the United States government? If you have a professional who has a word that's good in a court of law, is considered to be credible, is not, not a piece of evidence that you would not want to catalog and in in to put it into your book, I was not contacted by anybody. No government agent, not U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Nobody came to me to contact me to get my story right. or to talk to me about it. M meaning that whatever I saw was not significant to them. They didn't need that information. They already knew much more than whatever I could add. It was much more valuable to them to not tip me off that they knew anything rather than to contact me and catalog my sighting, right? Because I'm a professional, but then I found out over the years that I wasn't alone. There were many, many professionals, scientists, doctors, lawyers, cops that have seen these things, right? It's not an not a uncommon thing. It's but been, you're so outspoken about it. Yeah. So it, it would behoove them to discredit you to some degree, but it never happened. Well, here's the other thing. Because you discredited yourself? No. I, how did I discredit myself? Well, talking about the supernatural. Is that, is no. that seen as a way of discrediting I think, the phenomenon? I think you need to look at this thing in, in a much more broader picture than just focusing down on that. When you look at me in, in the big picture of what I've done, right, I've been a whistleblower against government, against cops. I've said a lot of bad things, incriminating things to not... I've generalized it. I haven't been specific about people. But I've told what I know and what I found out through investigations and what I found out, right? To the point that I'm talking about stuff that nobody else does and I won't let it go. But I think, and I've always considered this, that the Bigfoot part of me keeps me safe to an extent because it makes me not credible enough with everything, right? Because I can be written off because of Bigfoot. And so I'm, I don't feel unsafe because of that, right? That is something that it's all real and it's all true. And I'll tell anybody anything about it. I'm not hiding anything. But to close-minded people, which are these evil bad people it makes me not credible or a concern to them because it makes them look at me and because I have this background of Bigfoot that I'm so entrenched in that how can I be credible with anything else so I'm almost sliding through right. and able to not be a target because they just think I'm a whack job right even though I'm not and I'm getting through mm -hmm. I'm, I'm basically a stealth weapon against them kind of Right? Sure. Because, and that's why I, I mean, I would never go against the Bigfoot thing anyways. It's my life. It's my experience. Mm -hmm. It's a great, it's an important thing because it's also part of the awakening and part of this process, I think. This whole Bigfoot thing and my experience with Bigfoot, Bigfoot starts to open your mind up. And so you can accept and understand that things are not as they appear and there's much more going on. Right, and that you probably need to start going backwards to unravel everything that you and unlearn it all because that Bigfoot experience in everybody's life should force them in that direction. Unfortunately, I don't think it does with many because many people are so addicted, I guess, to this life and this way of things that the, to this lie that they can't allow themselves to go back and unravel it all so it can rebuild and, and come back with a clear understanding. So mm -hmm. it's all getting in the way of it for many of them. For me, I didn't have that problem. For you, I mean, you're, you're in that path too. Okay, but now let's get into the chapter here.
Uh, you have this hiatus period where you have the information. You don't want to talk about the mediums again, or should we skip that? Well, yeah, let's skip over that because I think people have, they know where, where we're going with that as far as people that have the ability to be responders and uh, receivers mm -hmm. um, and strong senders, and, and you work with people. Out of that. What I think is interesting, and we don't have to talk about it, is where one of them is located near Mount Adams, which is an interesting area. But we can get into that later. I want to get to the part here where after I come over, uh, you find the TP structure, your wife takes credit for it, you think that's odd, I think that's odd. And then you find a spiral on your window, the only other spiral that we know of on your window, which is huge uh, as far as if you're looking into what the spiral means and looking into you know, the Fibonacci circle and going to these power spots. Um, there are some ladies down the road here that have a spiral painted on their mailbox, which are some interesting women, to say the least, the stuff that they're into. And you find this on the back of your window. Um, you don't know who did that. You asked your daughter who would have drawn a spiral on the back of your window. Did you ever come back with any answers? Uh, I asked her, did you do that? She said, I might have, but I don't remember. <laughs> That's what she told me. Okay. There were two of them. There was a big one and a small one next to it, and they were very perfectly done yeah. in it. The finger looked a little, possibly it could have been a little wider than normal. It was a little bit wide, but it was very nicely done. Okay, so here, I'll just be honest with you. Is it possible your family wants to protect you from going down the rabbit hole? And they're saying, I did it. Okay, uh, don't, don't think anything else. I built this. I don't, I don't need Rich the Bigfooter. No. It's not like that. Like I don't think so because the way that I talked to them, when I talked to them about it, yeah. they're nonchalant about it and it's like I surprised them in the question and they legitimately thought about it and my wife had a, oh yeah, I did that. I just wanted to see what you would think, she said. But it just happened to be exactly the same as the one that, that I did, you know, and uh, she never seen one that I did before. Okay, show me where this uh, teepee was. Right there. Out of the way. And how tall was it? About six inches. Okay, and was it spread out? No, it was standing. It had actually, the balance stick had fallen off to the side when I seen it. So did your wife know the detail about the balance stick? In the road? Yeah. No. Okay. She so didn't never know that I made that. That would be a weird extra thing for her to do. Yeah, but she did it. I never had talked to her about that. So do you believe she made it? She said she did. I mean, I take her word for it. Yeah. So my tr rig was parked exactly where that trailer is with the yeah, back window right, facing right out. Here. And there was a big one here. Is this the truck? Yeah. The Jeep? There's okay. a big one here that went like this. Okay. That big? Yeah, it filled up the whole window. And then there was one that was small next to it that was about this size. Okay. But uh, it did honestly look like a thicker finger might have done it because it was a wider. It was dusty and it was wider. It no, is? I just erased it. And then I thought about it later. I was like, mm, maybe I should have. <laughs> well, are you that kind of guy where you will... Uh, take a photo or anything like that? generally not you're not but no. if i really thought of significant i might but no. you know i've honestly even been that way with tracks and stuff is that i i don't know the evidence and a lot of it other than the hair and the dna mm -hmm. it was mostly just for me yeah you know and i wasn't that concerned about proving it to anybody because of me you know i don't think Tracks and hair and, and all that stuff is great and, and fingerprints and everything. It, it's proof. It's physical evidence. Right. But we're well beyond any of that, I think. Yeah, you've moved on beyond that. I mean, I think we are coldly because you can produce this stuff. You can take uh, fingerprints or handprints or footprints to a forensic pathologist, look at dermal ridges. They can confirm to you that it's real. They can confirm to you that it's anomalous to humans. It's not right. exactly the same. Yet, with that evidence and proof, and you combine that with footprints and hair and DNA and everything else, and still we don't have a body of evidence that you can take and, and say, here you go, this is it. Where's my confirmation? Right. You know, it's not here. So where do you go from that? You can keep bouncing against that wall and producing this stuff, you know, but it's futile at, at some point. I mean, I mean, how many track casts does Jeff Melding probably have? 14 or 1500 maybe of different individuals. And w that in itself is proof of a living thing. Right. You know, because a lot of these casts have dermal ridges on them and other artifacts that, that would uh, indicate a real thing and not a hoax, you know, and, and all right, show people what is up in the woods here because I think it'd be interesting. If you don't mind. No, no, we'll show it all. Uh, is this wind damage here, Rich, above you? Probably. Yeah. I mean, I don't know because the truth of the matter is that could have died and broke, but 
something you have to consider about these little cedar trees. And this was something that I would notice out in the woods even before a Bigfoot. And I always question under the canopy how these trees would get tipped over and bent uh -huh. because the wind can't do it. You have to really come in here. Something would have to hit the top of it, right? Well, you got to realize these are short trees and they're very springy. So even a hundred miles of stained wind couldn't blow them over like this. Yeah. So this area here, when Michael was describing to me that these things were up on the hillside behind my house, looking in my windows, I started looking around and sure enough, I found spots that look like something was sitting down. I'd find little piles of sticks next to it that are obviously set there, like something was bored yeah. and breaking little piles of sticks and putting them around. And that was through that area, which is now all cleaned up. But then this area here, I noticed that if you look at these cedar trees, they're all bent over in a circle. And this was something I noticed about six years ago yeah, here for, in the first part, uh -huh. but they're all around here like this. These are all trees under the canopy and they're pushed out and apart over. And this is right above in the same spot, you know, that, um, and it's in a circle, but there's no natural mechanism that would could attribute to any of this. Especially this guy. It's Nobody. So, so low on the base and it's not rotten. My dad didn't fall any trees across these and knock them over and then clean it up. These just got pushed over somehow in a circle area. Yeah. And um, I mean, look at them. Something that grabbed this tree up this high, pulled it over until it snapped. And it pushed that one over, except that one didn't break. It just yeah. Got pushed, it bent down and it probably compromised it there, but it allowed yeah. it to stay over. That one snapped. And how many years ago did you find these? About six now, probably. And uh, I tried to establish some gifting on this stump and stuff, but nothing happened. Nothing here. No, nope. but look at those two, two over there. There's another one there that was snapped off. I mean, they're, they're all pushed away. So in relationship to, you didn't notice that one before you did? What, that one little one? Yeah. Oh, the top, um, yeah. maybe. That one looks actually kind of fresh, does, to be honest with you. Yeah. But to look at it, the wind couldn't have done that. And another tree limb could have knocked it down. Where's but the other one over here? You said there was one on this section? like. Well, that right okay, there. Gotcha. But, okay. but I mean, here, if we can find one of these trees that's intact here. Come here. I mean, I don't have the force to be able to move something that big, but that little one's dead, so it will snap. Yeah. But if we can find a live one. To demonstrate how hard it is? I don't even think I can do it. There's a creek that runs right through here. Okay, so this is the area. You that lake is, this is the drain that comes out of that lake. You tried to cultivate some kind of interaction. It never happened. Right here. Yeah. Which is plenty out of the way. I mean, I can see your parents. Patio, you never had anything happen here, though, that make this a hot spot? No. I'll tell you one thing I did see. I possibly might have had a sighting here when I first moved in. Uh, something caught my eye, and I saw something big and dark move that looked tall. Yeah. And, it, and it just went out of view from me, and I caught it out of the corner of my eye, and I wasn't sure. But it was highly possible. And um, But I never got a chance to focus on it or see it. It just happened to right. be. I looked up, and I see something go whoop right out of view and I had a feeling I was being watched and it was coming from right, it was right down over here. She freaked out over at night the other night, something was in the woods here, I don't know what it was. Yeah. But you know, I, I honestly don't really think they come around here anymore. I, I could almost feel it when they were mm -hmm. and it was a different feeling. Right. Everything was stagnant, the animals were quiet, you didn't even hear birds. All right, so. The case isn't closed yet out here at Richard's house, undisclosed location in Washington. Um, we will get back to a different chapter here along the way, but I think uh, we've got what we can get today. All right, so a few minutes after I cut the camera off, uh, the rain really started coming down, but as far as the audio and video concerned, take a look at it. Uh, the audio was uh, far and uh, above beyond any of the audio I was able to capture in a Pacific Northwest uh, rainstorm. And uh, that was largely in part, I will thank her again, Ira Wolfnesson, for her donation to Strange Brow Radio with the wireless Rode microphones. Man, just uh, a, a perfect thing to have. And I'd like I said, I'd love to provide more of these field videos for you. I mean, we have a, a beautiful gimbal that she's donated, these microphones, a fantastic uh, lens, and, um, and, a, and some extra lighting. So we're ready to go. Uh, we just need 
a way to get out there. And the way, the best way you can do that is by supporting the channel through Patreon, going to the merch store at Strange Brow Radio, getting something for uh, your loved ones this season, or you can uh, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Just hit the little subscribe button and share this video. But as far as the beeps, you heard sensor beeps within that. And I usually, I don't have to censor as much, but because there were specific names and the F-bomb, YouTube hates the F-bomb. Uh, you can't do, uh, you can't be as flexible when you throw out the F-bomb. So when it came to certain specific places and uh, the F-bomb, you, you got the, the old sensor beeps. So I hope you understand that part, but most of this you already know in regards to Harstein Island. I mean, if you type in Rich's name, his encounter uh, is listed as the Harstein Island incident. So um, that's no secret. In fact, Travel Channel has been up here all summer filming on and off of uh, Harstein Island and near portions of it. So that should be interesting. In fact, that's supposed to be a big secret that they're up here filming this year. So. Yeah, they had wildfires and they had uh, COVID, a, man, a national pandemic, a global pandemic, and here they are running around looking for Bigfoot. So it should be a smoky, face-covered season. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how they don't include that as part of the plot because it was really thick up here. And to be trapped in some of the country they were trapped in, um, I use the word trapped loosely, it, it will be interesting footage coming up on Expedition Bigfoot. Also, stay uh, tuned for your ability to vote on another strange stroll, another island, Maury Island. I'm going to do an overnight at Maury Island, or I'm going to do a overnight at a forest where there's experimental aircraft being tested, including a flag of what is the Space Force hanging out front and uh, interesting place to, to go. And uh, so these are uh, your chance to vote on one of two locations for these strange trolls. And again, more video and uh, hopefully great video at that and audio from these locations. So just like a choose your own adventure novel, you're going to vote on where I go. Maury Island, the famed UFO incident where donut-shaped craft dropped off slag and mass witnesses uh, all saw the incident happen. And then, of course, uh, the place I just mentioned, which uh, I've never been to. I've been to Maury Island and some strange stuff happened there. But um, an overnight, never done an overnight as part of a strange stroll. So those will be the specifics. And I will have those... Uh, I'll have the the vote ready to go here, so uh, check out that. I'll try to attach that to the public Patreon page so you can be a part of that. Now, what should be a hidden Easter egg, I'm going to give a little bit more of an outright boost to. At the end of some of these podcasts, in the record hiss, at the very end, sometimes you will find some hidden gems and this is maybe one of those moments, especially if you check out the, the video portion. And uh, I'm not going to tell you who's appearing and, and what's being said, but um, it's just a small example of the type of people that we've interviewed, we want to interview, and keep providing original content and really original information, too. So um, always uh, stick around for the, the end of the show and see if there's anything waiting for you. Remember, if you've got a story or you'd like to be a guest, you can do that at strangebrowradio at gmail.com. Just shoot me a message, anonymous as you like, or if you have a location, uh, we're going to be doing a special on locations and power spots, places where the veil is thin, so stay tuned for that as well. And if not, I will see you in the trees.
The following conversation was recorded with Yakima Native American and witness Mel Scahan, famed 1967 witness Bob Gimlin, and Sasquatch Rendezvous organizers Sandy Nelson and Kevin Carney. Because of the virus, everything has changed so yeah, dramatically that uh, we don't do the things that we'd like to do no, or don't. even go the places that we'd like to go. No. Mm. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to get that virus. At nope. my age, I wouldn't live two weeks if I got it. Mm. And so I'm not ready to go yet. I don't think God's ready for you yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. We like having you here with us. And so what what made you come back out again? Because you weren't you weren't doing the conferences before that. I mean that was that one time event that made you Yeah, the one time event. Uh, and that was because Demetra Banoff came to the United States to have some time with me, the Russian scientist. Really? And so uh, he came into Seattle here, and who was it went to pick him up? Can't remember now. But anyway, so he said, well, I want to go by and see Bob Gimlin. Mm -hmm. So they come by my place, and there was a conference going on in California, or getting ready to go, and he was wanting to go down there. So he said... Uh, well, Bob, why don't you go down to that conference? I said, well, okay. If you're going to be there, I'll go there. And so uh, I can't remember who all... Oh, oh, John Green. So it was. John Green. I picked him up in Seattle. And uh, so I rode down with him and John Green, and it was quite a conference. That's what really turned me back to going doing things it was 2003 and god there was a slug of people there probably 500 well you know not like the big conferences right, right. but and uh there was quite a few speakers there uh and i was one of them and so when i got up to speak everybody stood up and i thought <laughs> What the heck is going on here? <laughs> so when I got through speaking, they all applauded me, and I thought, hey, this is okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's when I started going back to conferences. That's when I started going to conferences. Yeah. Because before that, you know, I had so much ridicule around the Yakima area, and uh, Judy got ridiculed, and, uh, and so... Uh, I didn't want nothing to do with it no, until I that particular day. And, uh, God, things just turned around completely, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought, That's well, right. hey, this there's a few people out there that believe in mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the Bigfoot. And, no. and so they were all there, you know. <laughs> and, um, boy, to, and to stand up and get an applaud, I thought, Gee whiz, is there somebody else? <laughs> is there somebody else around here? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I mean, yeah, you've been how many? How many states have you been to? Oh God, I've been back? to a lot of states. Mm -hmm. A lot of states. His favorite's Hawaii. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> remember for Hawaii. sure, oh, but I've been to. Oh God. Ohio, Indianapolis, uh, that's Texas. the two that I can remember the last. Texas, I think you went to Texas, didn't you? Oh, oh Texas, two or three or four times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Georgia? I, yeah, I was down, I was called down to Texas there were, uh, before I went to the other ones, and, and um, a guy by the name of Craig Woolheater got me to come down to Texas and uh, God, I met some incredible people. I met an attorney guy there. Great big old good looking Texas dude with fancy belt buckles and stuff. And he says, hey, partner, he said, would you like to come on down and do a little roping with me? And uh, he said, uh, we rope every day down there at my ranch. He said, I've got 
Forty thousand acres out there. This is a small place. He said. <laughs> Forty thousand acres. You call it a small place. <laughs> he was. He was an attorney. Mm -hmm. And and I thought, God, that's no place for me down there. And mm -hmm. so I never did go down. But, oh wow! But he invited me to come down and stay. And he said, uh, and he said I got a little place out there. He said. Uh, for guests, and he showed me a picture of it. Jeez, fancy damn place. I said, <laughs> you got that for the guests? And I said, I'll be down. Don't show me your house. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told me a story about the Texas guys. Uh, he said, down there we hunt in tree stands. And he said, we put corn down at the bottom of them. And he said, uh, deer, boar, and hopefully Bigfoot come in. And he said, I was up in this tree stand about 30 feet up. And he said, uh, it was kind of a moonlight night, but the clouds had come over the moon. And he said, I, I looked down there at that pile of corn and there was a Bigfoot sitting down there raking corn out and and eating it, and the little one running around, jumping all over it, and the big one would shove it back when it got close to the pile of corn. And uh, he said, God, I couldn't believe this. So he said, uh, I I had my rifle and everything, but he said, I, I thought maybe about shooting it. And he said, then I thought, no, don't shoot it. And then it got dark, and he said, uh, then it disappeared. He said, left. Yeah. So he said, that's when I was became a believer in Bigfoot. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. He said, I never right. saw one before. Yeah. Never saw one after. But he said, wow. that pile of corn down there underneath that tree mm -hmm. that he put down there for boar and deer, mm -hmm. uh, it was raking it out with a stick eating it. Mm -hmm. and, and so something familiar with that behavior, uh -huh. you know, yeah. back when I was a kid, you know, the grandparents ate first. Oh. And we never sat at the table with them. We were always fed in the other room. Oh, and so to hear that one shoved the mm -hmm. other one out of the way, hey, do you hear?